Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we'll be counting down our picks for the top 20 worst video game controllers of all time. For this list, we'll be looking at some of the most infamous and despised pads in gaming history, including some lesser third-party creations. While many of these controllers had interesting ideas, they definitely missed the mark when it came to form and functionality. What do you think was the worst controller ever? Let us know in the comments below. All right, on to the top 20. Before we continue, we'll be doing a deep dive on this list's number one entry over on Mojo Plays, so be sure to check it out once you've finished watching. Number 20. Nintendo 64 Controller We can say, we will walk through walls. We will take a look around. There's no denying the Nintendo 64 Controller is an iconic, innovative device. Whereas Sony's PlayStation launched a controller that seemed stuck in the past, the N64's analog stick and Z-Trigger gave players new ways to interact with 3D games. But strip away the rose-colored glasses, and it becomes clear that the N64 controller gets more love than it deserves. The Trident-like design was awkward, making it impossible to hold and comfortably reach all the buttons at the same time. Meanwhile, the actual analog stick was terribly designed with a connecting point that it eroded quickly with regular use. The N64 controller will always be an important part of gaming history, but it's time to admit it was kind of junky. Number 19. Coleco Telstar Arcade The three-way microprocessor console. Start with this roaring road race. Gun the throttle. Faster. An unholy melding of console and controller, the Telstar Arcade is easily one of the weirdest video game systems ever made. Released in 1977, Coleco's first-generation console is notable for its triangular design and peripheral integration. The Telstar had three built-in control inputs, a steering wheel for driving games, a gun for shooters, and a paddle for Pong. While the controllers themselves were sturdy and responsive, the software they were attached to was a step behind what Atari and other game makers were putting out at the time. Telstar was undeniably novel in its design, but gamers wanted genuinely new experiences, not a glorified toy that was outdated the moment it hit store shelves. Number 18. Nintendo Wii Remote and Nunchuck The impact of the Nintendo Wii and its brilliant adoption of motion control cannot be overstated. When the console launched in 2006, everyone and their grandmother wanted to pick up a Wiimote and play Wii Sports. Unfortunately, like the N64 controller and Super Mario 64, the Wiimote and its nunchuck attachment seem designed with just one type of software in mind. With the exception of Wii Sports and a handful of Nintendo first-party titles, using the Wiimote and nunchuck was a painful experience. While much of the blame falls on the Wii library's shovelware problem, the Wiimote's lack of one-to-one -one motion controls didn't help matters. Thankfully, Nintendo largely moved away from motion control by the time the Switch came around. Number 17. PlayStation Move With precision, accuracy, and responsiveness, it's hard to deny the PlayStation Move was a serious step up on the Wii's motion controls. The problem is Sony stuck with the move for a generation too long. Sony's decision to tie Move into PlayStation VR arguably held its surprisingly good virtual reality headset back. As the aging motion controllers lagged behind the superior controllers used by rival VR sets like HTC Vive and Oculus Rift, the Move controllers were easily the PSVR's biggest weakness when it launched in 2016, breaking the immersion of numerous games thanks to drifting issues. While we respect Sony's dedication to the move, it should have ditched the controllers at the end of the PS3 life cycle. Feel that good and it does. Number 16, ColecoVision Controller. Wow, ColecoVision, way to go, Amy. I did it just for you. When you buy ColecoVision, you make two kids happy. Home consoles from the early 80s aren't exactly known for their sleek controller designs, but even among its contemporaries, the ColecoVision pad stuck out like a sore thumb. The original controller looks less like a game controller than an off-the-shelf telephone, only with a big, ugly joystick where the earpiece should be. Like many controllers of its era, the ColecoVision joystick suffers from poor build quality, with little in the way of precision or responsiveness. There are a ton of nice big buttons, but most of them are redundant, as the majority of titles only used a few of them. 
will always have a soft spot for ColecoVision and its arcade quality software, but the controller should stay in the past where it belongs. This controller is f***ing horrible! Number 15, Sega Dreamcast Controller. Uh, so I mean you're gonna find that's two or three times faster than, than the PlayStation of the N64. Ahead of its time in some ways, and woefully outdated in others, the Dreamcast controller was truly a mixed bag. Sega's biggest innovation with the Dreamcast pad was its two expansion sockets, which could house removable memory cards called VMUs that doubled as many handheld systems. But besides being ahead of the gaming industry's second screen wave by at least a decade, the Dreamcast controller had little going for it. Uncomfortably large and lacking a second analog stick, this is also one of the few controllers to have its cord run out of the bottom, a curious design choice that only made the thing more cumbersome. The Dreamcast may be one of the most influential consoles of all time, but we all tend to forget the controller was kind of a drag. Number 14, Intellivision Controller. More sophisticated than any video game that has come before, providing hours of entertainment for the entire family. Throw the Intellivision on the pile of retro consoles that thought controllers with numeric keypads were a good idea. The Intellivision was unique among its contemporaries in that it had a flat circular dial for directional control. Capable of 16 directions of movement, this thumb pad was an important precursor to the modern D-pads. Unfortunately, it's arguably the controller's only redeeming quality. Mattel took its home console's intelligent television design a little too far, as the vertical controller closely resembled a TV remote. The result was a controller that had an annoying button placement and was uncomfortable to hold. While it's surprising that more controllers didn't copy the Intellivision's flat control disc, at least it helped usher in the era of the Nintendo D-pad a half a decade later. So in total, that's 17 buttons. And for games this complex, you really need that many. Number 13, Konami Laser Scope. With the visor on, sort of like the Data Trans Network. All right, increase the volume. Why shoot a gun when you can just give the order to fire instead? This must have been the thought process behind the laser scope, a head-mounted light gun made by Konami and licensed for NES. Compatible with all games that supported the NES Zapper, this cumbersome headset was not only way less fun than Nintendo's infamous light gun, but barely worked properly. To shoot an on-screen enemy, players would yell fire into the headset. Unfortunately, the laser scope's microphone was so sensitive that background noise often interfered. Kids also quickly figured out they could shoot anything into the microphone and get the same effect. A feature we're sure parents absolutely loved. Hey Alexa, can you fire the laser scope into the sun? Number 12, Atari 5200 Trackball Controller. It's like as big as a VCR DVD player. It's big enough to be the game system, let alone the controller. Like many home consoles released in the early 80s, the Atari 5200 had many arcade ports. Unfortunately, playing these games on the console was kind of a nightmare with the console's original controller. The trackball was designed to address this shortcoming thanks to its titular directional input. However, the yellow trackball's small size and disappointing build quality only served to highlight that you weren't playing on a real arcade machine. Given the controller is roughly the size of a Sega Saturn, you'd think Atari would have been able to put a bigger trackball in it. While it made playing games like Centipede and Space Invaders a little more enjoyable, the 5200 trackball was an inessential add-on for arguably Atari's worst home console. Number 11, Newbie Boomerang 64. Hey, at least somebody tried to fix the Nintendo 64 controller. Developed by third-party manufacturer Newbie, the aptly named Boomerang 64 was an attempt to simplify the standard N64 pad. Unfortunately, it ended up creating all new problems in the process. Putting the analog stick and D-pad right beside each other created some awkward thumb stretching, and the placement of the triggers on the underside was hard to get used to. But the worst part of this controller's form factor, as the boomerang design made players' elbows flare out at odd angles and contributed to a lot of unnecessary wrist soreness, it's a fun novelty, but with the standard controller as bad as it was, N64 owners didn't want one that was even worse. Number 10, the Duke Xbox controller. I got some boys here I'll make you wish you were never born. I've got Arctic Avenger. Dark Master is in trouble. Buffalo Soldier. Oh, Dark Master, man. Halo, online gaming, a built-in hard drive, 
Microsoft got a lot right with the first home console. The controller? Not so much. When the Xbox launched in 2001, it came packed with one of the largest video game controllers of all time. Nicknamed The Duke, the controller seemed like it was designed exclusively with Shaq in mind, as you needed really big hands to hold it comfortably. The worst part is the Duke's massive size overshadowed the many things the controller did well, which included asymmetrical analog sticks and responsive triggers. Thankfully, it didn't take long for Microsoft to replace the Duke with the Controller S, a smaller, lighter version designed for regular human hands. Number 9. Alpha Grip AG5 Your fingers can fit on them easily and not get the wrong letters. Theoretically, putting the mouse and keyboard experience into a controller you can hold in two hands isn't a bad idea, if you can execute it. While technically a handheld keyboard, the AG5 certainly looks the part of a video game controller, sort of. Alpha Grip designed its plastic monstrosity to be an alternative to standard keyboards and one that would be optimal for both typing and gameplay. However, the learning curve was too steep to make PC gamers want to give up their traditional mouse and keyboard. If you were willing to invest dozens of hours into it, the AG5's comfort and mobility may have been worth it. But for everything else, $99 was too high a price to learn a whole new control system. Number 8. Rollin' Rocker Each game responds differently, but none of them work. Is Rollin' Rocker the greatest controller name of all time? Absolutely. Does it have anything else going for it? No, no it doesn't. But as an accessory for the Nintendo Entertainment System, it was less of a controller than a big floor mat with tilt controls. By standing on it and shifting your weight, the idea was for you to be the D-pad. However, the thing barely worked and would easily break if you weighed more than 100 pounds. Sure, it was compatible with nearly every NCS game, but at what cost? A lot of broken ankles? That's what. Unsurprisingly, the Rollin' Rocker was a major flop and was quickly forgotten by everyone but the most dedicated hobbyists and collectors. Number 7. U-Force You? U-Force for Nintendo. Yet another embarrassing NES controller, the U-Force is a laptop-like device that gives players the use of hand gestures as control inputs. By hovering your hands over different quadrants, you could make your character jump fire, and perform other abilities. Unfortunately, it all added up to a bunch of hand-waving with little to show for it. The device's IR sensor panels were notoriously ineffective and often failed to pick up players' hand movements. When it did work, the U-Force could actually be kind of fun, especially in games that seemed tailor-made for motion controls, like Mike Tyson's Punch-Out! However, like the Virtual Boy, this is an example of gaming tech that was ahead of its time and would take decades to hit its stride. You do you force. Number six, Sega Activator. Okay, so I'm in this here. is called the Sega Activator, and this one happens to be with the greatest heavyweights of all time. Why use your hands when you can use your feet instead? This Sega Genesis peripheral's big gimmick was using your lower half as a controller, though you could use your arms too. The octagonal ring sat on the floor with players activating it, get it? On the eight quadrants to control the on-screen action. Although it gave players a good cardio workout, this had more to do with the fact that the device was terrible at registering movements. And even when it did work, the input lag was so bad it made most games all but unplayable. While the Sega Activator was the first full-body motion controller, that distinction means very little given it was a massive flop that barely worked. Wild or what? Who won? Oh. Yeah. What do you guys say? Number 5. Philips CDI Controllers What do I do? Just point and click. It's fitting that one of the worst consoles of all time would also have one of the worst controllers. The Philips CDI actually had a number of poor quality controllers to choose from, but the one that came standard with the console was a truly sorry sight. It's bad enough the console was home to no less than three atrocious Zelda games, but then gamers had to suffer the indignity of using controllers that resembled a third-rate DVD remote. Then there was the CDI touchpad, which to this day features one of the strangest joysticks you'll ever find, an elongated hunk of plastic that never felt right. Bad graphics, games, and controls, the CDI's legacy is nothing if not fascinating. Number 4. Atari Jaguar Controller What's 
64 bit and you bought a Jaguar. Yeah, I guess I did. Atari's last ditch effort to save its console business was doomed from the start as it went up against two powerhouses in the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis. But the Jaguar also didn't make things easy for itself by launching with such an inferior controller. Massive, ugly, and featuring more buttons than anyone would ever need, the controller infamously brought back the phone keypad design that plagued so many consoles from the early 80s. It also didn't help that the controllers frequently unplugged from the Jaguar thanks to the loose VGA plugs Atari used. On the bright side, few people had to suffer through it as the Jaguar only sold about a quarter million units before it was discontinued in 1996. Number 3. Connect The Kinect might be the most successful peripheral failure in video game history. When Microsoft launched its full-body motion controller for the Xbox 360 in 2010, it sold more than 10 million units in just a few months. It was so successful that Microsoft would go on to make it an integral part of its next console, the Xbox One, with disastrous results. While the tech was impressive, Microsoft's vision of a controllerless world largely amounted to some dance games and family-friendly shovelware. It didn't take long for people to realize it was easier and more fun to play games with a traditional Xbox controller, and interest started to fade. Less than a decade after its debut, the Kinect was fully disconnected. Number 2. Atari 5200 Controller the most realistic just. Whole position at its best. Despite having what is arguably the worst standard console controller ever made, the Atari 5200 held so much promise. Prior to its release in 1982, Atari touted its new controller's analog joystick as offering more control than the 2600. While this may have been true in theory, the controller fell victim to limitations of its own design. The joystick infamously didn't self-center, which made controlling movement in the 5200 games a constant source of frustration. While a bad controller is far from the only reason the 5200 was a commercial failure, no one was sad to see it go when the console was discontinued after just two years on the market. The Atari 5200 Super System, its only competition is you. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos you have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure to go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Power Glove The Power Glove for your NES. Now you and the games are one. Hey, they did try to warn us. In 1989, you'd be hard-pressed to find a Nintendo fan who didn't want a Power Glove. Famously featured in the 1989 film The Wizard, Mattel's futuristic controller promised an attractive mix of keypad interface and hand motion controls. Unfortunately, the controller didn't function as promised. Difficult to set up and hard to use, the Power Glove didn't even have a left-handed option. Not that it really mattered. Despite Mattel's lofty goal of selling a million units by the end of 1990, it only managed a tenth of that figure and was quickly discontinued. While it's still an iconic piece of retro gaming tech, the Power Glove's lack of functionality and unfulfilled promise make it the worst controller of all time. Power Glove, everything else is child's play. If you want to know why we chose our number one pick for this list, head over to Mojo Plays and watch our in-depth analysis of the entry. Check the link in the description below.